a lot of people rely upon uh, Hitler and the Holocaust and all that sort of thing, the Nazis, as some sort of benchmark for uh, human morality and human uh, response to immorality or to what we would call the evil in the world. That interests me a great deal, um, and I can't say that I'm averse to using that uh, in my metaphors. I'm as guilty of invoking Godwin's Law as anyone else. But um, from my perspective, one of the most interesting sort of moral dilemmas, and I think historians generally agree, are posed by things like the First World War, where there's a massive cataclysmic battle uh, that just went on for four years in the most atrocious conditions imaginable for no clear reason. It just seemed unclear to just about anybody why this was happening and why they were watching all their friends get torn to pieces by shell fragments or gassed to death or uh, driven insane by uh, constant proximity to death and constant proximity to more than the human body can stand in terms of bombardment, strain, uh, that sort of thing. These people strike me as, I don't know, the people who went through it. I, I've i mentioned in other videos I'm prone to hero worship, and I tend to see the people that, uh, that we hear from uh, who went through all of this as individuals, as kind of every man or every person type heroes. They went through trials that I think most of us can hardly even imagine, and they all sort of adapted to it in various different ways. Uh, a lot of the adaptation wasn't all so great because a lot of the uh, veterans went home and became um, Stalinists or fascists or whatever. But a lot of the ad adaptation that took place was nothing short of heroic, if you ask me. And for all the dreadful things that happened during the First World War, dreadful it just seems so wimpy a word to use to describe things like Verdun and the Somme and uh, uh, that sort of thing, Passchendaele. But however dreadful they were, the human drama cannot be denied, if you ask me. It, it's one of those bizarre situations in history where the suffering has come to mean something to us and mean something decent, I suppose, like even, even as we, like I'm personally a pacifist, but I can admire the heroism of individual soldiers, not so much in how bravely they charged into battle, but how bravely they faced the insanity of the situation that they were in. Um, a little known or little studied uh, instance of the uh, First World War is the mutiny of the French army in 1917, and it's an interesting um, case study in which uh, the soldiers, the army, that had performed so heroically uh, the previous year, or the previous couple of years, mutinied. But they mutinied, actually, not because they didn't want to fight, but because they thought that the people running the French army were idiots who were just throwing all their lives away. They were more than happy to defend their country. Um, this probably should have happened, if you ask me, in the British armies. It, you know, it should have happened in the Canadian army, in the Italian army, in the Russian army. Well, actually, <laughs> it did happen in the Russian army, and in the German army. But the French, as they say, have a rebellious nature, or a tradition of revolution, if you like. So uh, that's how the French played out their revulsion with this insane war, even though they understood that um, that uh, that this wasn't about actual um, willingness to fight or anything like that. The French general staff understood the nature of the rebellion, so they didn't treat it quite as ruthlessly as one might expect. There's a very good uh, American movie called Paths of Glory with, um, um, what's his name there, Spartacus, um, Kirk Douglas, uh, an excellent movie, and I think it was by uh, either Ridley Scott or um, uh, one, one of the great directors, and it dealt with that. I, when is it actually more brave to mutiny than to obey orders? The British Army didn't mutiny, at least not en masse the way the French Army did. Um, but what a lot of the British soldiers did was um, they developed again, as I've mentioned in a previous video, the black humor of the trenches. And not just black humor, but um, a philosophy that deliberately avoided asking why, because that's the kind of question, as they said in Shawshank, that can drive a man insane. 
you're standing there in the mud of Flanders and the shells are flying overhead and everyone's getting killed all over the place and this is the third or fourth year you'd have to deal with it. And the temptation is to ask yourself, what the hell am I doing here? What is all this about? But the overwhelming um, thrust of the situation is you're here and you're going to jolly well stay here unless you want to do something completely drastic. The French actually did go and do something completely drastic, um, but the British never did. But the British, again, the, the, the Tommy, who was, um, if nothing, uh, stout at heart, he said, uh, well, I'm here because I'm here. They even actually had a trench ditty for that sort of thing. And that reminds me um, of one view of life itself. What are we doing here? What's all this about? This is crazy. This, this mad suffering all around us and everything. Um, it's, it's really enough to make you cringe. It's enough to make you mentally, physically, emotionally collapse, existentially collapse. There's no denying that the world is a crazy, unpredictable, mad place, and that when you stop and think about it, it's gigantically huge, the forces that are at play, resulting in each and every one of us being exactly where we are today. Um, it, uh, it does seem to be vast beyond comprehension, but um, if you understand that it might be beyond our comprehension, um, an attitude like Tommy singing, we're here because we're here, um, is not really that dumb of a thing to ask oneself. Because, the, again, what do we do about the incomprehensiveness of the world? What do we do about the fact that the world doesn't make sense all the time, or rarely makes sense? We can either stand there, frozen, like the deer in the headlights, like I said before, or we can just say the world just is. It is what it is. End of story. And no judgments placed on it at all. Um, there's no point in saying this shouldn't be happening because it's happening. There's no point in saying that um, bad things are happening and they shouldn't happen because they're going to happen. You can't stop that from happening. Antinatalism, if you ask me, seems to hold out, or it claims to hold out, an end to all this crazy uncertainty and crazy unpredictability, but I don't think that it does at all. Uh, it doesn't have any more answers than anything else does. And if you ask me, how you relate to the world around you is far more interesting how, how you mentally, emotionally, and philosophically relate to the world around you is a lot more important than what you actually physically do, what, you actually, what your actions actually are in the world. That's something that we do have control over. The cataclysmic, endless series of events that take place over the course of one simple day of our lives may be completely out of our control or so enormous as to be apparently beyond our control. The way we relate to them is completely within our control. We're here because we're here. Thank you.